I'm Mel Stewart, and this is Swim Swim Podcast. Joining me today is a legend. This man is swimming's first superstar. Today, we have nine-time Olympic champion, Mark Spitz, here to talk about 72, a gathering of champions. Fifty years after the 1972 Olympic Games, 11 Olympic heroes returned to, Mu to Munich, retracing their steps in an emotional first-person telling of the games that defined them. Mark, this is this is this is a surprise. I didn't see this coming. Why didn't you tell me ahead of time? Well, in confidence, I I really couldn't say anything. I'm under contract, but we taped this, uh, or at least my segment and all the segments in the month of uh, October of last year. Um, it deals, as you've already mentioned, with uh, these athletes that were from the 1972 Olympic Games, obviously my being one of them, um, and telling our stories as we basically walk in the same footsteps and paths that we created 50 years ago. And it's uh, they have access to this footage that's quite incredible. I know that there were, uh, as it was told to me, there were eight filmmakers that were brought to Germany to do in their own impression what was currently going to happen at the 72 games. Certainly my athletic performance was captured by each one of those eight um, filmmakers. So the Olympic Committee had access to all their outtakes. And there's something like about 300 hours of this footage of me that I didn't even knew existed and things that I saw that had never been seen by, by any human eyes um, because it never made any presentation or publication or uh, had any viewing audience to, to speak of. Um, and it creates actually a very interesting set of filmmaking opportunities because I had watched 20 minutes of it before we started and I didn't realize that all these cameras were around me, but there was one particular image where, you know, at any Olympics, we have to, uh, after we perform, they take the gold medal winners, uh, the silver medal winners, and the bronze medal winners, and then somebody at random, usually the fourth place guy, in case somebody tests positive, that they would move up and get the medal, have to take the drug testing, which, you know, before any athletic competition, you go to the bathroom a lot. So what's the first thing they ask you to do <laughs> after you get your medal? Come into this room and give us some samples. Well, that wasn't happening. So we had special water that was breaking the seal. and But we could leave the room if we had a monitor. In other words, in this case, a trainer or a coach. So I was with one of the coaches and it shows this film of me walking around with this bottle of water. Could have been interpreted as a bottle of beer or something like that. Um, but you could see 20,000 people in the, in the grandstands and it was kind of where the sun was coming through in the late evening. And then it was kind of misty, like they had fogged the whole swim hall. And it was like, wow, this is weird. And it's captured on this great film. It's like a movie. And I'm going, you know, nobody ever saw Mark Spitz other than the type of presentation that Mark Spitz had that was captured by what was the trend at the time. Oh, he's on the blocks. He swam this event. Boom. He got out. Have you watched every one of my presentations? Maybe somebody like Keith Jackson would interview me. That's all you saw. You never saw any sort of uh, pre-marching in or what you do on the blocks or warming up or anything like that. And all of a sudden there's this footage, hours and hours of this footage of me. Yeah. I was really there. Um, and, and, in the trailer, which has been released, you see me now currently doing something with my hands at the end of the blocks. Now that was pre-planned because I saw this footage and I said, you've got to actually show me do the same thing. And I says, and I'm not putting together what you're going to use, but since you showed me what you could use, I said, you just got to dissolve into me doing exactly that same thing on the block because you've got that footage and it shows me stepping up and then swimming the race. In the in the trailer, that's exactly what they used. And um, it was quite exciting. They did the same thing. They must have listened very hard because uh, 
Olga Corbett's uh, piece was actually taped after I did mine. Um, and at the very end of her segment in the documentary, she does some little cute thing with her hand, part of the last part of the four or five seconds of her routine floor exercise. And they dissolve into her doing exactly that same thing. Um, it's very effective filmmaking, in my opinion, because it, it transposes what we are today as 50 year olds into that environment. Um, the beauty of my environment and my piece that you'll probably see, it's the third uh, documentary, is the swimming pool had 50 million euros to just basically rehab the thing to what it was like the day I competed. So the pool looks the same, the the, the tiles, the flooring, uh, everything is the same. The only thing that's missing is 20,000 people grandstand, but the actual filming of me was confined to the pool. So the juxtaposition of the filming of this documentary and then me swimming was like, almost like when you watch the film Titanic, remember where they are looking at the wreck and then they kind of go in and out of a color phase of, of actually going back into the 1900s of, of what it would have been like to be on the ship. It's kind of that kind of movie making and documentary that, that, that was really interesting. They, they tried to do that with uh, Olga, but they were in an, a basically an empty arena that didn't have the uh, raised platforms nor the uh, different stations of apparatus that, that, that you would go to uh, from the floor exercise to the balance beam and, and all that other stuff. But still, it was very effective. Where, just so our audience knows, we are 50 years past 1972. And that's something that a lot of people are talking about and sharing among their peers. And uh, this is an International Olympic Committee property. It's being distributed on olympics.com. It's four episodes. My understanding, it's an hour per episode. Uh, the first episode is live right now. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the links to the trailer in the show notes and episode one in the show notes. And I can you share when when this narrative focuses on you? Because of course, for our young listeners out there, you, we've, we've got to remember Mark Spitz is our first superhero, our first superstar because of the 1972 experience and that moment in time. Seven gold medals, seven world records, the most celebrated Olympian in history. Um, when, can you share when they focus on on, on your narrative? Yeah, so the first one that was released was uh, August 11th, which was last week. Uh, the 18th, which will be tomorrow, um, will be the second documentary. And the following week, the 25th is mine documentary. Uh, and then the following week is, I believe, September 1st, which will be the, the last documentary. So what they have is they have uh, four athletes that they featured in the first documentary. They, I believe, have three athletes that they're featuring um, tomorrow or during this second episode. And then on the third documentary, which is myself, I'm the only one in the whole hour. And then the fourth documentary is another two athletes. And then they spend the rest of the time talking about the Israeli tragedy. And because we were all asked the same question, where were you at that time? What did you do? How did it affect you? Um, how did you continue to focus? You know, were you completely done with your competition? Um, or how did you handle that? emotional event. Um, and so it, it's quite a package, as a matter of fact. And I know that um, there'll be a press release in September 15th of when we would be able to see this uh, on conventional television. But the audience for social channels, and you and I have discussed this, is far greater reaching and for a longer period of time, especially since people can basically tag in and download this and stream it at any time they want. So. Um, the Olympic Channel and the people that follow uh, the Olympics has quite an audience, way larger in millions than than regular television. Um, so, you know, it's kind of an exciting time. Um, it's the first time I think that they've ever actually taken this type of uh, a documentary approach and, and captured uh, modern technologies and filmmaking today. Um, I've been told by many people who have called me already that have just actually seen the first um, documentary and said, wow, that was just a ca captivating, you know, it was emotional, it was moving. Um, so I think the young audience will gain from an insight into the windows of what we were going through back then. 
Because nobody saw Mark Spitz swim unless you saw me swim in 1972. There was no downloading from a cloud Mark Spitz's performances. Um, you really have to hunt on the internet to see that. Now you can do, you know, you can type up Michael Phelps or Natalie Coughlin, and you can see practically every race from when they were an age grouper somewhere uh, in the internet. But that's not the case back in our day. It just didn't exist. And there's a bunch of licensing rights and things like that that people are basically holding on tight to their vest. And this stuff just doesn't circulate this way. So this is a great opportunity for me to basically catalog and have in my own personal library um, the, the idea that I can see myself swim in the way that if it was a presentation today, uh, what it would have been like. And now I do have my videos that were given to me by the network uh, that did the Olympic Games back in my day, ABC. And so it's 52 minutes of my events at exactly the order that I swam and then the interviews are included. And um, it's quite compelling to watch that. Um, I still time, I, tr I still try to, when I sit back in Mel and I look at some of those races, I'm going, how did I get up every single day and, and get prepared to basically act like it was the first time out there without the fatigue factor. But um you know, I did somehow. <laughs> I'm just lucky that my races weren't as close as Michael Phelps's races. So I had a little bit of a margin there. There's, there's two points of context that people should understand. And you touched on it a little, a little bit. Today, we have so much coverage. The Olympic Games, when it's on, it takes over media for 16 days. And you have access to an, an enormous amount of coverage from a lot of different point of views. Back in 1972, on network coverage, it was covered like a news event. And if I remember correct, it was Jim McKay who was the host. Is that correct? That's correct. As a matter of fact, the first time that they actually had more than 40 hours, uh, they go back to the 1968 Olympic Games. Um, it was basically an 11 o'clock news event where, oh, today happened in Mexico City this, so that the newscaster would come on instead of his five-minute segment, he'd maybe have a 10-minute segment, and they would show, well, here's the winners through graphics and maybe a little video here and there. I mean, I've hardly ever seen any of my races that were in Mexico City. So the first time they really had this massive coverage, I think they had some large number of hours, you know, six, eight, 900 hours, whatever it was. And I could be totally off in the numbers, but what they did was they recorded the tape live for broadcast via uplink satellite for in that same day to New York, then the rest of the continental United States would see it. But most of the finals in swimming were done at six o'clock at night. And so therefore it was noontime in New York and it was three o'clock, I mean, nine o'clock in the morning in California. So by 1030 or 11 o'clock for people that lived in California, they knew whether or not Mark Spitz won a gold medal or not, but they wouldn't be able to see the actual telecast until between eight and 10 o'clock at night that night. But that was pretty remarkable and very advanced in its day. So that was when, you know, I became larger than life because of the way the presentation happened daily. And so the storyline built for the eight days of my swimming program uh, the, the Mark, Sp story, uh, Mark Spitz story started to develop and, and all the other athletes stories would develop at the same time. So four years later, of course, they're waiting for another Mark Spitz. And what they had was this story from Bruce Jenner winning the decathlon and other great stories that happened uh, during the Montreal games and the stories that didn't happen. And in swimming in particular, these Germans were clobbering American women swimming, you know, with Shirley Babishoff should have won six or seven gold medals instead of these German gals. And we're well, still there, talking there, about that. There's something that should be, that should be said here. That I, there were two points I did want to make. Um, you put the context in terms of what it was. It's a news story. You had 52 minutes from the network when it was over. If you compare that to a Natalie Coughlin or uh, a Michael Phelps or even a Caleb Dressel, who we saw recently, there is so much coverage of our swimming stars today it is the same as they get, they get this, this is the amount of coverage they get. They get so much on camera time. It's the same amount of time as a network star on a hit television show where they're a leading man or a leading woman for an entire season. And it's compressed into their coverage two days running up to the games and the teasers. And then the eight days, whereas you had 52 minutes with the, with the news coverage and, and just the coverage of your races and the interviews, something that you found, excuse me, something that you learned when, when this documentary film was coming together uh, was that these other filmmakers were there, the three other, and they captured you in 35 millimeter. So they captured, this is sort of like 
opening up a dimension into that world in 1972, you had no clue it was there. And uh, so this is never before seen footage. And anybody who knows swimming has, has, or has an understanding of Mark Spitz has seen most of the footage from 1972. This is all new. This is, reason, this is the reason why I'm going to tune in. Uh, in the trailer, you look like you get a little bit emotional. You know, I, I really, I really didn't get emotional. I remember I was so surprised. Well, first of all, I went over there and I had a cold. So I was just trying to get through that. Um, uh -huh. in, in the trailer, I, I said, wow. But I could have been saying, wow, I can't believe I got up every day to, to swim like that. Or I could have turned my head. I remember say, wow. Um, yeah, wow. I, I did break a world record. I, I was sort of acknowledging a question that had a rhetorical answer because it had already been discussed. You know, I did these interviews for five and a half hours sitting around um, and then walked the village for another two hours the following day and went to the swimming pool for a couple of more hours. Um, we even went to the room that I stayed in, which was remarkable uh, in the village. Um, you know, in the trailer, that's the two minute trailer. There's a picture of me or actually part of the moving picture of me when the other three athletes, uh, were standing there after the medley relay, my last event, and two of them picked me up on their shoulders. I'd only seen that for, for when you can see my face, I'd never seen it from the perspective of, from like almost the grandstands, like as if they were a spectator and you could see from the backside that happening and how they picked me up. So the funny thing is, um, I don't know exactly what's going to be in the full documentary. I'm assuming that that's a clip from it of myself, but I I, I'm going to get the impression that I've talked to the director. They want the people that watch this to feel as though they were actually in the grandstands at the time when he was watching, they were watching Mark Spitz and not from the perspective of a television show where we constantly got those cameras on a dolly and they're watching, you know, some, you know, low profile. And now they have the overhead cameras. I think that's all great production. Um, we didn't have that. So they're left with what they have in materials. And I, I, I think we sort of captured some of that in the first documentary. So, um, Hey, I already know what the storyline is. <laughs> Most people do. We already know what the result is, but I think just from a storytelling point of view, um, I've never had a chance to be interviewed for so long about one specific thing. And I think we went through every single event and who my competitors were and who and what I was thinking and what would have happened had I not been out in the lead. I mean, I don't know what's going to make the air, uh, but I know that he had enough material there and they felt that the material was good enough to hold the whole show for an hour. Um, so I'm very honored, you know, um, that that happened and it only because now I have more things to look at, <laughs> you the know, but that I'd never had a chance to see. Greatest Olympic performance. And uh, it was, uh, so let's, let's for, our, for our young listeners, let's put it in perspective. Uh, no cap, no goggles. Um, and you, I'm, I'm assuming, were you in a Lycra suit or a nylon suit? There were only nylon suits back in those days, and goggles were illegal to swim in competition because they um, there weren't that many variety of goggles for that matter. And number two, they came from Australia, most of them, and a lot of countries didn't have um, mail order, order online. I mean, just nobody was carrying these items. So if there was an advantage, they didn't want it not ex exclusive to only the people that could have access to that. Well, let's, um, let, let, let's, let's, let's give some perspective on this because no, no cap, no goggles, nylon suit. This is a brief. This is a, this isn't, you know, not a jammer, not a full suit, not a, not a body suit. And yeah. I'm not, I'm going to, so seven gold medals, seven world records, but let's go through the individual events. Hundred fly 54.27, 200 fly 200.7, 200 free 152.78. And, and your hunter freeze of 5122. And here's, here's my perspective on this. I think that if I'm looking at these times today, I'm looking at your hundred free, which was one of the events that you were like, I'm, I might not swim this race. Yeah. I think that might've been your best performance. I think that time holds up better than most of them. Well, originally my hundred fly time did um, for probably 15 or 20 years, because that would have at least put me into finals in some cases. But look, at, I've been asked this question before in a roundabout way. You know, what do you think I could have done had I just focused on one event that if I went to a 
big international meet. And I just didn't have to worry about so many four individual events and then being a participant on relays. Um, you know, what could have I done? Uh, my first event was the 200 fly. And I so much wanted to be the first person to break two minutes. But I was so far in the lead that I knew that I was swimming in a relay about 45 minutes after that race. And I also was swimming for another seven days. And so, you know, I did what I had to do to win. And in the course of that, uh, it was never the intent, not in any race that I ever swam to break the world record. It was strictly let's win this race and then think about tomorrow. Um, I, just, I, just, I guess I guess say this. You, you, you backed off because you have seven more days. You got a relay. You sandbagged it. You still broke the world record. Let's just give it the respect <laughs> it deserves. You sandbagged it. You're saving up. You're Sammy save up. You still broke the world record. You know. You know, my, my 200 freestyle, for an example, was my second um, individual event. And I had to swim against uh, Steve Genter, and he was ahead of me at the 100. Um, I was sort of like, in my philosophy of swimming the race, um, I always had a problem in that race to get out fast the first 100. As a matter of fact, at the Olympic trials, I think I was dead last at the 150 mark. But then I went ahead and blasted everybody the last uh, 50 meters. I, I think the rule was, is that if you're not a half a body length ahead of me with one lap to swim, you're going to lose the race. Um, and I knew that. Um, and maybe it was because I just had a hard time, you know, putting it all out on the line in the first part of the race. Um, but I was able to win that race and, and come home with, I don't know, half a body length lead in the, two, in the freestyle. Uh, the hunter fly, I was very nervous with this guy named Roland Mathis, who was the world record holder in the backstroke. And he really did have the potential of uh, swimming a really fast time. I never thought about the Americans as being a threat, but he got just the worst start in the world for some reason, for whatever reason that was, I don't know. Um, and then I won that race, to, uh, I, I believe, very easy. Uh, but then I just kept thinking about that fourth individual event, the 100 freestyle. I'm the world record holder in it. And gosh, maybe I should just scratch and then I'll just swim the relay. And it, six gold medals is probably win the medal. Six gold for six tries is way better than six gold. And whoa, what, did, what, what happened to Mark Spitz in the 100 free, you know? It was like, I don't want to have happen like Mark Spitz was the world record holder in Mexico City and the 200 fly qualifies first. And if he had done the same time, he would have won. He did one step better. He got dead last eighth. So, but my coach, Sherm Shavor said, man, they're going to call you a chicken, you know, a deserter. You've got to swim this event. You're, you, you know, everybody else is second guessing whether or not they trained well enough, whether they've rested well enough, whether or not the room in the village is a nice, quiet room. I mean, you have proven time and time again for the last five days, you're swimming and you did all those things right. And you're in condition. You're not going to get tired. And he said, whispering in my ear, but can you do me a favor and go out fast the first 50? He says, that's how I think you're going to win the race. I said, you mean if I go out fast? Well, then how am I going to swim the last 50 meters? He says, go out fast and then get faster. And that's your problem. Figure it out. <laughs> well, guess what? I did go out fast. I got the lead and I held on and won. And I don't think if I'd gone out that fast, I don't know if I would have had the juice and the energy because of the swimming for uh, seven days. That was the seventh day. The, the relay was uh, the following day. You, you mentioned oh, your fly was. You mentioned your hundred fly was probably the uh, the better stand up time. The uh, it, it for perspective by the nineteen eighties, everybody was wearing caps and goggles, and we were wearing paper suits. And if if you dropped to fifty three anything in the hundred fly, you were you were a stud. You were fast. You were, you were in contention to win Olympic gold, world championship uh gold uh i remember when pablo morales went at 52 8 in the 52 82 in the 100 meter butterfly and we thought that was the craziest thing in the world and it took a long time before people topped him it seems like that race didn't really crack open until uh until after the 2000s but well, uh, they were starting to do dolphin kicks you know quite a bit on the turns um i always wondered you know um I couldn't invent a swimsuit that didn't exist at the time. Um, and gosh knows if I would have been able to wear my goggles and have them stay on my face uh, from diving in. 
But the one thing that I could control was I could do a dolphin kick. And I, you know, if somebody told me, hey, try that, you know, I'm just like I tried the grab start that wasn't done between the 1968 Olympics and 1972 Olympic Games. I mean, that all of a sudden evolved and that that increased uh, being able to swim faster, you know, just getting off the blocks a little bit faster. Um, so, um, it, it, you know, it, don't, Mel, it almost doesn't matter if. I mean, I could go back to Johnny Weismuller. I mean, if you look at the pools they swam in, I mean, I wouldn't even think of putting my toe in, the, in, a, in a pool that's, that was cloudy and you couldn't see the bottom or anything like that. You know, um, they had a float on the lane lines like every 15 feet. I mean, you know, if you got hung up on the lane line, you'd set, you know, cut your arm off like a piece of dental floss. But hey, but that was what they dealt with at the time. Um, and, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing. You know, a lot of these athletes now, um, I don't think they realize how good they have it. I mean, look at the technology just in the starting block, um, you know, with being able to adjust, you know, how you do the track start thing. Um, I mean, it's, I mean, what, what, but if everybody had that technology back in my day, well, maybe the times would have been just a little faster, but I think the results would have been the same, you know? It's a... Uh... It was in, in the seventies, seeing those times, I know those times like the back of my hand, because I had a poster that was almost a, of you with your seven gold medals. That was almost as big as I was. <laughs> and it, it wasn't hung on the wall. It was, it was, it was sitting over by my bed. So I'd roll out of bed and I'd see it every day and I'd stand up. And I think it was almost up to my shoulder. It was so mm -hmm. big. Yeah. And I, and I, that was, that was, uh, and then I, 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 I did my, my salutations to you and my, I honored the, the God of swimming Mark Spitz and that, that those were my formative years in the sport. Take me, but let's, let's, let's just focus here on, on the 50 years. Um, you know, you, you're, you know, we measure time by so if we're lucky enough to find the right woman and long marriages, we, we measure it by the birth of our children, but you have this other milestone, this, this one unique moment. And uh, 50 years is, is quite a bit of time. Is it, uh, how does that hit you? Cause this is, you know, it's the 50 year anniversary really all year. This is, this has to be top of mind. What, how, what, what's going through your head? Um, that's an interesting question and it's difficult to answer. Um, because while it's happening, it's sort of like you're living in the moment. I, I, I think that if, if I could go back to 1972 and if somebody says, what do you think you would be doing in 50 years from now? Um, I wouldn't have been able to answer whether or not my record would have still be standing. I wouldn't have been able to answer, um, you know, if it wasn't who may have done it and how did they do it in what events did they do it in? Um, nobody had those answers. Um, and they said that that my record was a record that would live in in perpetuity and, and forever and ever and ever. Uh, I never thought that. Um, I, I thought that one, I couldn't even perceive the idea that the Olympic Committee was going to add a fifty, for an example. FINA was going to add a fifty to the Olympics in swimming. I mean, boy, that would have been right in my wheelhouse. Maybe I would have been able to win another medal, um, provided the schedule provided me an opportunity to swim that and not conflict with the swimming the 50 free, you know, back up against the 200 fly or something like that. I have no idea, but so, um, you know, back in my day, we only had 15 events and I, I won seven of those 15 events. So that's uh, almost 50% of the swimming program. How would, how would that affect swimmers to come after me for 50 years? And I, I'm just perplexed at not having the answers back then. And, and now that I've looked back, I can say, well, but here's what happened. Somebody took a journey to do what I tried to do. We see this person come into his own, the first Olympics in the 2000 Olympics. He doesn't medal. He then goes to the next Olympics in 2004, and he does a great job. He wins uh, six events or whatever it was and takes a couple of other medals because he actually participated i think it was an eight correct me if i'm wrong and you know who i'm talking about and then in all of a sudden in 2008 he goes through this epic journey um 
But that was a 36 year process to have somebody have the stars align, the fortitude to live with Mark Spitz hanging over his head. Um, and how that would, I mean, I don't think I could have done something like he did, Michael Phelps, with knowing that that record, which was so monumental, and the pressures that were around him with not only his sponsors, but his coaches and his family and his teammates. Um, and then having to talk about somebody other than himself and having to justify, well, what do you think? You know, is that record going to go down? I mean, I would probably hate Mark Spitz, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, because I couldn't go to sleep thinking about myself without somehow that I mean, I had something similar in a way with Don Scholander, but that fleeting moment happened from the time I swam with him from 1964 to 1968. And I made the Olympic team with him and actually swam the 100 free. And he was only an, a, a relay participant in 100 free. So he got fourth in the race. And so he wasn't in the individual race. So whatever I had in bad feelings about him didn't last very long because I went past him very quickly. Um you know, it, it didn't take me that long to pass his record of four gold medals in Tokyo. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at the fact that I was able to do something like that. Um, it's hard for me to remember all of the hard work and the workouts. I sort of tried to estimate the amount of yardage that I swam for training. You know, it's hard to remember exactly what I did, but I came up with something like 24,000 miles. And it's probably an underestimation for the time I was eight years old as an age group swimmer to the time I retired at the age of 22. But there were also 200,000 people that were in the sport of swimming at the time, and they swam probably equally as far as I did, equally as hard, trained as many as ours. Um, but why was I singled out? Well, for the same reason that Michael Phelps was singled out, you know, we figured out a way to be 5% better on an ongoing, consistent basis, race after race. Um, and um, we built on our confidence and we didn't have too many negative things that happened to us because even what we would consider negative to get second place, and I've always said that's the first person to finish in second place, um, is still an accomplishment. And I still think that if I'd never gone to Munich, my two gold, a silver and a bronze, even though I didn't win an individual gold medal is still pretty amazing. I mean, just to call yourself an Olympian. And there's so many people that go to the Olympics. There's over 10,000 athletes that go to the Olympics. And I calculated that there's probably about um, between gold, silver and a bronze, and plus some team sports, um, only about 10% of the medals actually make it into the hands of all of these 10,000 people. So does that mean 90% of the people go back to their country as losers? No, they inspire young people to get into their sport and maybe they can represent their country and represent themselves and feel proud for themselves. So in my reflection for 50 years, I think that how many people that either I directly had a contact with or indirectly, had an influence on what they were able to accomplish and point in case Michael Phelps. I mean, if there was no Mark Spitz, he may not have actually fought for trying to accomplish those goals, which were monumental to most became secondary to him because he went on to even win more medals in future Olympics after he won eight gold medals in Beijing. So the impact of somebody like myself or anybody in any sport that can get to a milestone of 50 years definitely had an impact. And, and this documentary, I think it, you're going to see that. And although some of your audience that are swimmers may have never heard of these people, in their own right, they were at the top of their game, unbelievably so, at that time. And they influenced just as many people to move forward in the Olympic movement and in the athletic movement, for that matter. Well, it's something that's happened that is measurable is that since 1972, uh, the registration for swimming, I know domestically with, with U.S. swimming and then United States swimming, because the USA, it was AAU until 1979, then became USA swimming. The registration has gone up every single year. And it's been uh, a lot of people have looked back to 72 and said that was that was the moment when they really started to see marginal you know, increases. And uh, I know you inspired a whole generation uh, and 
I just think I was a kid in the seventies. And I was also, my first Olympics was 1988 in Seoul. And the pressure was on Matt Biondi. Matt Biondi, remember that? He was, he was, he swam seven races. And the, the narrative for his entire Olympics was, will he win seven gold medals? And that was a lot of pressure for him. He didn't, he didn't pull it off. He had a, he had an excellent games. Hey, guess and, what? Uh, and a result of that, for somebody that wasn't actually waiting around for uh, Matt Biondi to win all those medals is now the coach of Katie Ledecky, Anthony Nesty. I mean, so, hey, guess what? Look at what it did for him to not pay attention to all the naysayers. He wins the gold medal, swims in America, and, and he is actually phenomenal of what he's been able to do as a coach that, that, that reaches way beyond somebody like myself even. I mean, I didn't turn into a great coach. I wasn't something that I thought was going to work for me, um, but, but certainly worked for him. And um, it's just phenomenal, you know, especially to um, what he's done in the, for swimming in his country. It's, um, I, I have to ask you about this. The, I have to ask you, it, it, I think that there's been, there've been two terrorist incidents at Olympics uh, in history. Uh, I, if someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but 72 is a Munich massacre. And we had the, the pipe bomb at the 1996 Olympic games in Atlanta. Um, this is a part of the narrative in, in these episodes. Is it, uh, can you give us any insight into this moment? And it's, uh, this was when, uh, the terrorist group black September took the Israeli athletes hostage and, um, can you give us some context for that? This was after your swims were over, but you know, put us in that in that world in that moment at that time. Well, back in 1972, the first day of swimming uh, program started uh, on a Monday. Uh, I was in the very first event, and then it ended the following Monday with the uh, medley relay. Um, so I was in the last event, and I swam every day except for the Friday. I had no swimming on Friday and I was in the water. I think it was 15 times or 13 times, I believe. No, 13 times between trials, a prelim, prelims, semifinals and finals. Uh, we only had semifinals and hundred events in those days. Um, so Monday ends. Um, I go out to dinner with these two guys that had followed my career from Sports Illustrated, a guy named Jerry Kirschenbaum, who was the writer, and then Heinz Klutmeyer, who was a photographer. Um, and uh, we went to dinner at a real fancy restaurant, and it was all fun. And we came back at around 11 o'clock at night. And I uh, was awoken at 8 o'clock in the morning because I had a press conference at 9 in the morning at the press center, which was uh, adjacent to the Olympic Village, but you had to go out of the Olympic Village, drive around because it wasn't uh, attached to the press center. Um, and the reason I had a press center um, press conference at nine o'clock was is that halfway through uh, swimming, we decided not to do press conferences anymore after an event because most people only swim one event. So it's fine. You hang around, you do the press conference and that's it. You're out, you're done for the day. You're done for the whole Olympics for that matter, you know, cause you only maybe had one event, but because I was swimming every day, I had the, the responsibility of going back to the village and then having some dinner and then starting the process again. So everybody was very accommodating. They said that would be fine. So it was arranged at nine o'clock in the morning, I'd have this press conference. So I wake up at eight o'clock, I go to the cafeteria, I have my breakfast with the uh, United States Olympic uh, officials that were going to accompany me, plus the coaching staff. And we get into the bus, we get over to the press center and who greets us right when we drive up was Jerry Kirschenbaum and Heinz Klutmeyer. He says, well, have you heard what happened? I said, well, no, I don't. I mean, what do you mean it happened? I won my seventh gold medal last night and I had dinner with you. That's all I know. They said, well, there's a lockdown at the village and there's maybe some terrorists. Um, so this, you're going to go into this cauldron of people that are going to want to know what you saw. And they're not going to be, I'm telling you, they're not going to be interested in asking you any questions about swimming. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. And we had no answers. I mean, ironically, we walked right past that street called Conley Strasse, where all of this stuff started to happen, like in the early morning hours, like at three or four in the morning, which we later, after the fact, found out that they had broken into the Israeli compound and the fencing, I think, um, and wrestling team killed two athletes, threw one off the balcony, and then some uh, guard uh, of security happened to see this body and they removed the body before the, the sun rose. So everything just like it was a normal day. 
So this press conference was supposed to be for about an hour because at 10 o'clock, I was supposed to see Jim McKay for an interview about what it felt like to win my seventh gold medal. So I was there 45 minutes early because it was in the same building because the press conference ended because I had nothing to say because we didn't contribute to anybody's curiosity because it was a lockdown at the Olympic Village. So Jim McKay and I were talking about what was going on. And on the monitor, they had all of these pictures of these telephoto cameras. And if you remember, maybe you don't, but back in the day in the late 60s and 70s, when they would used to show a ski event, you know, like, you know, giant slalom or alpine event, they'd have these cameras, you know, where they'd have these telephoto lenses from long distances away. Well, since the press center was actually had their cameras now, they put them up on the roof of the press center. They're now trying to get camera shots of the Olympic Village. And they see this shot of this guy with this Pandora hat on coming out to a balcony, talking to somebody that's just one floor down, dressed in kind of a Bavarian hostess outfit, which was these gals were dressed like that to just help athletes, you know, get through the village because it was like a city uh, for instruction. But it turned out she was a crisis negotiator. Nobody knew this at the time. And, and so I did my interview with Jim and then I left and I went back to the village. It must have been about 1030. And now the swim team is just waking up because they're going to the FINA Gala, which is in Garmisch Park in Kirchen, about a 40 minute drive just to the south of Munich. And everybody's actually confined to their rooms because now all of a sudden they can't really go to the cafeteria unless they're escorted past this one street of where all this activity is going. Well, meanwhile, I'm watching TV in my room and it says that, uh, well, Mark Spitz is in Italy. And then an hour later, Mark Spitz is uh, believed to have left, and now he's in Sweden. And all along, I'm just sitting in the village. I mean, somebody had to go get me my lunch, you know, on a tray and bring it back. And then the chancellor of Germany showed up in my room. Um, and then um, my parents uh, um, came in from Garmisch Park and Kirchen because that's where they were staying. Um, and they were able to get into the village. Um, and then the State Department was there. And the next thing was there was this game plan. Now, I, along with Shirm Shavor, were going to go to actually Stuttgart later on that evening. And I was supposed to pick up a car that was going to get, be given to me by Mercedes. And then the next day, drive it to Frankfurt and be put on a, a combination a cargo plane, passenger plane to Chicago. And then I was going to dental school. Well, none of that happened, Mel. Um, I ended up getting taken to the airport at about four or five in the afternoon. They put a big army blanket on me in this Mercedes down below where all the parking structure was. And I remember since there were really no cars in that parking structure because it was designed as a, an apartment complex and the only infrastructure of cars moving around were basically just transports for the uh, shuttles to different venues. And if you recall, the track and field, the gymnastics, and the swimming were in one location, but every, all the other venues, the people had to get on buses to move in the city to go to their particular sport of competition. And there were these school buses and down there, and I didn't pay attention to it, but in retrospect, it was those buses that they took those Israeli athletes to the Army Air Force Base later on that evening. Meanwhile, I boarded a plane to London uh, with Sherm, and then we stayed in London. And then the next day when I woke up, I was informed by just reading the newspaper that was at the door uh, what had taken place. And so then I was uh, scheduled to get up very early in the morning, uh, take this picture uh, where my famous gold medals, all uh, seven of them were draped around my uh, chest, and then rushed off to uh, Heathrow Airport where I boarded a flight to Los Angeles and then another flight to Sacramento. So all of a sudden I was home with my two sisters watching the memorial service that had taken place the uh, that afternoon so it was like out of body experience here 48 hours before i was on the podium getting my seventh gold medal and now i'm in sacramento watching this tragedy unfolding and an explanation of wow where's the olympics and what is going to happen now for the longest time to be honest with you um the logistics of what they did with me is part of basically a program that what would because I'm the only one that basically implemented some sort of a ad hoc scenario of what happens if there's a terrorist attack to safeguard not only the athletes, but the officials and the spectators and the citizens of that city. Um, so I'm not sort of at liberty to talk about all of the logistics and some of the stuff I'm actually aware of uh, because I was brought in to the fold of discussion. Um, but certainly, 
they don't want to implement anything like that. The other terrorist attack that you're talking about was not directed specifically at a, a nation or a race or a religion or a particular athletic group, but it was just somebody in a public environment at the Olympic Park where they decided to basically create havoc. Uh, ironically, I had just left that place because I was doing some interviews um, in that particular location. And then on the way back to where I was staying, which was about a 20 minute drive, that happened. As a matter of fact, I think there's a very famous scene of uh, uh, Janet Evans, actually, when the bomb went off. I mean, right, I mean, from the backdrop, from behind her, you could see this explosion. And I mean, it sort of rocked not only her and and that tower that she was doing that interview from, but the rest of the world. It's, how could this possibly happen, you know, so many years after the Munich incident? With all of the people that go to the Olympics mail and with all of the preparation, and they spend millions, hundreds of millions of dollars for this, those are the only two-sided incidents. And the first one was unforeseen. So I think they've done a great job, the Olympic Committee, um, and, and not having that happen again. Now, that doesn't mean it couldn't, but um, I'm not one to release the information about what the logistics are. Um, I'm sure it embraces some of the same technologies and concerns that they dealt with me on. And I'm sure there's way more advanced scenarios and there's more athletes involved and there's more headline stories and not that any athlete is actually above anybody else. Um, so the process of gathering everybody at the Olympic village has got to be one of those things that's taken under consideration. And so it's just not as simple as well, what are you going to do with Mark Spitz? That was just one person. You know, now it's everybody. If you're a young kid and you want to learn a little bit about the Munich massacre, um, I'm, my question for you, Mark, is would you recommend Spielberg's film Munich that he shot in 2005? You know, that is a, basically a movie that is factual. Um, it is from it starts off right from sort of like. After it happened. I mean, a little bit like here's what's happening, but really it jumps within the first five minutes into, you know, who are these people and the, the, the quest to try to hunt them down. Um, it's, it's quite amazing uh, as, as a filmmaker, um, how because it, it, it had great reviews and it was. It was well produced. Yeah, they need to they need to see that. Um, but also this documentary, and I don't know how they're going to piece this together is going to have a reflection of all the athletes that are in this documentary of where were you, what did, and how did it affect you? Um, and how does it affect you now? And how do you feel about that now? Um, and I, 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 I know that from, I've asked the producers, well, what did everybody else say? And they said, well, they pretty much said the same thing that you said, and it's common sense, you know? Um, you know, you try not to think about it as an athlete, you know? Um, but somewhere in the back of your mind, you're wondering, well, you know, I've got all these badges and I can't go here. And, and then I'm prevented from going down there. And my coach can't actually come over here. And then I can't see my parents unless I go to some neutral territory. And then, you know, I don't have to tell you, it's, it's, it's worse. I'm telling you, way worse than trying to go through the line to get to your plane in an airport. <laughs> I yes. mean, even to have to go to the bathroom. I mean, it's just nonstop. Security's tight. Security's very tight. It's, uh, you know, you're in Olympic games when you walk by soldiers with machine guns and go through checkpoints. It's, it's a, uh, but I'm glad, I'm glad it's there. I'm, gl I'm glad that, that that's done because, uh, I'm sober enough to have remembered what happened when I was a child. That was a, that was a big moment. It, it's, uh, I remember it like nine 11. Yeah. Um, you know, so 50 years is a long time. Um, you know, we, uh, like you said, you know, you and I have been married for years. Um, as a matter of fact, I've been married for 49 years. Got married in 1973. So next year will be a 50 year anniversary for being married. Um, so, you know, frankly, um, we're all human. We all have our wishes and our likes. Um, and I, I, uh, I just, I just think that um, I'm glad that I had the courage 
to dream what I dreamt. And I've, I've, I've said, you know, it was the mystery, the magic, the wonder, and the innocence of never having done something like that before. And I'm glad that I just kept thinking about it and training for it and never giving up. It wasn't a question that I wasn't going to fall down. And it wasn't a question that I was going to have some hiccups along the way. But the sooner I recognized I need to get back up and fight on, that to me was the most important part of, of being successful. Um, and that hasn't changed for 50 years. Those storylines and those sort of thoughts certainly have to be the backbone of a Michael Phelps or anybody or a Simone Manuel or a, a Simone Biles or any, they take the sport, it doesn't matter. You know, just being and having perseverance. And they and their stories will be told in 50 years from now in the same way because they'll still stand up for that discussion. Because those people that actually took our place, the reason that they were able to take our place was they learned from us. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swim Podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.